Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to 5 and 9 in the One Stop Co-op Shop, where I go over five things you need to know about a game in about nine minutes or less, somewhere around there. Today is a comparison review. I am taking a look at Call to Adventure Epic Origins. This is the third big box set for the Call to Adventure series. The first one was just called Call to Adventure. The second one has been on my shelf for years at this point, the Stormlight Archive. Uh, spoiler alert, I really like that one. And I'm going to compare it to Epic Origins. If you are unfamiliar with Call to Adventure, it is a game that evokes going on an adventure with a character. You're going to begin with a character and you're going to be drafting cards, collecting symbols, rolling some dice, and ultimately you're going to end up with a tableau that will tell a complete story from beginning to epic end for your character. How does Epic Origins fit into the Call to Adventure product line? Is it one that you should be looking up if you have the base game or if you don't have the base game? I will answer all those questions coming up. Full disclosure, I was an original backer for the original Call to Adventure. Since then, I've gotten reviews copies of the Stormlight Archive and Epic Origins. For these bottom two points, I'm going to get some cons out of the way, especially from a product side, and then we'll get to stuff that I enjoy. So uh, four or five is the, another base set, a con. So what you're looking at right now is what I have for Call to Adventure. It is a Stormlight Archive, the base game, the name of the wind, and Epic Origins. It all fits in one box uh, in terms of its gameplay. I don't like throwing stuff away, so I have a bag <laughs> full of runes and tokens. This is completely useless. You only need one set that goes in uh, the basic box. I imagine uh, as the product moves forward, it seems like the design is more settled. Uh, I'll say more about Epic Origins feeling like the updated base game, and then they'll add on later. Uh, but for now, please, no more core sets. My point number four, a straight up con once again, at least for me and my expectation, uh, is the included quote unquote campaign mode. So it's the first thing you see when you open the product, you say, Ooh, oh my goodness, uh, we have envelopes, we're going to get an exciting campaign. What it really is, and I have uh, chapter one uh, over here, is that they have taken the content and gated it. So uh, this is uh, just a regular adversary card. This is an adversary and uh, cards that you just shuffle into the basic deck. Once you finish this, you'll basically have the complete game. As I said in the previous point, I understand that Epic Origins is kind of the new base set. So it makes sense from a, a new player perspective to gate some of the content, uh, bring them along slowly, introduce more complex adversaries. Uh, that's pretty good. But uh, for me, uh, calling it a campaign <laughs> seems a little bit uh, deceptive. There's no character growth. It's just, you know, one game after another. I wasn't uh, totally pleased with this approach. My number three, which is mostly pro, is the re-engineered characters. So uh, this is the base game characters and you had your origin cards, uh, motivation and destiny. Uh, so then uh, if you imagine building a character, this is where you're from, you know, you're a squire, you're a farmer, you know, where you grew up, your background uh, in kind of classic D&D terms. This was your motivation. Uh, so, you know, why are you adventuring? You know, I'm a sworn protector. I'm thirsty for knowledge. Uh, this is the character's verb, so to speak. And then here is your destiny, what your goal, ultimate goal is, high arcana, one with nature. It felt very organic. It was really lent itself to storytelling very, very naturally. Uh, most the same uh, here in Epic Origins. Your background is mostly the same as well as your destiny. Uh, this is added, which is your heritage, uh, what in classic D&D would be called race. So then, you know, construct, elf, human, uh, bird folk, uh, <laughs> kind of uh, missing in the old uh, story, but having them in here and also giving them a power which keys off a certain role, uh, I thought was really well implemented. I have one little con from a pure storyteller's perspective. There's no mechanical difference here, uh, but it is in these middle cards. Uh, I just mentioned about motivation, uh, creating all sorts of opportunities for role playing at the table. Uh, here, uh, you get class <laughs> in Epic Origins, you know, Druid and Bard and Barbarian. So I imagine that emerged from, you know, player feedback uh, where they just want something that feels familiar. So this feels like good old D&D, quote unquote race, uh, ancestry heritage. Here's your background. Here's your class. Here's a prestige uh, situation. So. I, you know, a little bit of a trade-off for me as a person who likes the more open-ended role-playing, but overall, from a mechanical perspective, Epic Origins way ahead of the pack. 
And now we get to some pros, P-R-O, all capitals, which is the reworked adversary system and therefore the reworked solo and co-op system. The original base game was clearly designed as a competitive game with solo co-op kind of tacked on. So you had these adversaries which were seated into the main deck and their adversary deck was basically anti-hero cards that anybody could play in a competitive game. They were extracted and made into a bot deck, which just didn't work. So you had cards like this. Play after another hero has attempted a challenge, they must attempt it again. Really? Just lose a turn. <laughs> and there's plenty of um, cards like that. It's just like lose a turn or very frustrating, uh, which work in competitive, but in a solo co-op just didn't. In Epic Origins, they fixed that. Now the adversary has their own deck. You're gonna see some powers that make sense. Reveal this as a hero attempts a challenge, it has plus one. There you go, you're not gonna just lose a turn, but it does become more challenging. Also, each individual adversary is gonna have a card that shuffles in to make it a particular to them. So that's a really nice little wrinkle. Also, in the original game, and this was my biggest frustration, the way that the powers work of the adversary, they were very easy to avoid. So this one says whenever you fail a intelligence check, I think that's intelligence, uh, the adversary gains there. Just don't fail an intelligence check. <laughs> You're not going to make that many of them. You could put your resources towards them. It was very easy to just basically ignore most of the adversaries. Here, they're reworked. They're always getting in your way. They're a little bit more complex. And uh, you didn't deal with the adversary until the end of the game in the base game. In Epic Origins, you have the sub boss, which you have to encounter after Act 2, and the mega boss, woohoo, uh, which is your Act 3 adversary. So you're always uh, interacting with it, it's in your way, it's part of your story. Fantastic. And so my number one, uh, it is a pro for me, is the core gameplay loop, which is basically the same from base game, Stormlight Archive, and now Epic Origins. You're going to be drafting cards one at a time. If the card has no challenge, then you would draft it and you would get the benefit. If not, then you would gather your runes, whatever you have on your sheet, and attempt the challenge. So I have played this game with multiple groups, and the biggest off-putting factor for many of them is that for a lot of the turns, the choice is fairly obvious. So then I have a very inti a wisdom character over here. I don't want to pick a lock or fight a goblin. I want to question my faith. And there's no real option. I mean, I could take the trait, but I'm not working on that. My destiny and my other aspects it doesn't really care about that. I want to go for this. So the choices can be really obvious. The dice rolling, uh, it is sometimes it goes against you and there's not much that you can do. So I feel like a lot of players struggle. Both at the same time, the game feeling like on rails a little bit and also a loss of control. However, I don't need that from a call to adventure. I don't need this to be a meaty game where I press a lot of buttons. I lay this down. I have a nice, easy, simple matching solitaire time. And it's just a pleasing experience for me at the table. And once again, as with all the other sets, a nice story emerges as I complete my character. So just know what you're getting when you're going into it. If you like Call to Adventure, Epic Origins is probably the best version of it, but it doesn't change the fundamental experience if you didn't like it. Final thoughts time, in my opinion, Call to Adventure Epic Origins is the base game to get over and above the uh, original base game that was released a couple of years ago. So does this blow the doors open? If you didn't like the original one, will you like uh, Epic Origins? Probably not. <laughs> it doesn't change that much. This is for folks who enjoyed the base game well enough, but they had difficulty with like the solo co-op and some of the other uh, card interactions. Epic Origins smooths all that out. You can tell there is more mature design that went into this. And so it definitely feels like the new jumping off point uh, for this system. Do they combine? If you have the original, should you pick up the Epic Origins set and combine them for this richer experience? I don't know if it's richer because at the end of the day, the powers are pretty similar. Uh, I think that you'll get most of what you're looking for just with Epic Origins alone. And if you play a lot, and you want that variety, then go ahead and mix the sets. They're perfectly fine. I like the Stormlight Archive. I like the Name of the Wind. I like those sets, and I look forward to them dipping into those um, novel properties, but I recognize that most people want that kind of open-ended D&D-esque uh, flavor for their Call to Adventure, so it is there for you if you want it. This is Jace with the One Stop Co-op Shop, reminding you that we'll see you at the next stop.